So what we have here is a large beaker with paper towel. And the paper towel is soaked in the water from the beaker, which is dyed with blue food coloring. Okay. I have on the other hand, a spray bottle. The bottle itself is tinted red, which is sort of even unfortunate. It's the water inside there is also red. And I'll just go ahead and prove that to you. So red water. All right, I'm gonna start spraying red water at the top of this towel here. Um, what's gonna happen at the bottom? What I want us to observe is what's the response at the bottom of the towel to the spraying at the top. So we might imagine this is a soil column and, or even a watershed on some level. Uh, and I'm gonna start raining at it. Um, I'm gonna rain at the top. I can't uh, drop water at the top edge like rain would if, anyway. Um, what I want us to look at is, okay, here's a thing that's pretty wet. And I want us to look at how quickly the drip rate at the bottom responds to me spraying near the top and how quickly it how long it takes for the water coming out the bottom to turn red or even purple starting now okay so i just saw a drip out the bottom yeah, so the drip rate at the bottom has picked up. Of course, that water dripping is blue. And we can see uh, there is red that's working its way towards the bottom. And there, the red has kind of reached it. Now we're getting purple drops. And it's not going to be uniform. In fact, that's kind of typical of reality that uh, even as I get mainly red water coming out the bottom, there are still parts in my fake soil column that are that are blue. Um, even in a homogeneous thing like a paper towel, uh, water does tend to take preferred flow paths. Of course, it doesn't hurt or help or whatever. It's part of that's because I'm mainly spraying in the middle of the towel, and that's where the water first went down there. All right, I think I can stop that. So at this point now we see the towel is almost entirely red, but the point what is that we didn't have to wait for the towel to turn red for the water to start dripping at a higher rate from the bottom. Well, what's the implication of that? In, there are a couple of implications of that. One is for uh, what's the response that we expect from a watershed and what's the water that's coming out of a watershed when it rains. What we expect then is as it, when it rains, especially if the soil is wet already, 
that the flow rate in the stream will pick up pretty quickly, but that the water that's in that stream is so-called old water. It's water that's pushed out. You know, say if I've got water coming into a stream, okay, that water is coming from the alluvial aquifer. That water in the alluvial aquifer is getting pushed out by water coming out of the hill slope soils and pushing into it and displacing it. The water in the hill slopes that's getting pushed out, that hill slope water is getting pushed out by the rainwater. So what we're seeing in the response in the stream is that pressure wave due to the rainfall. We're not seeing the rain water itself except for, you know, of course there is some water that falls directly on the stream, but the water that's predominantly in the stream is a signal, right? It's not the actual rainwater, but it's the signal that is uh, created by that pressure wave that the rain produces. And so that's that's the that's a lesson for say stream flow and the peaks in stream flow that we might expect that streams in general respond much more quickly than the travel time. The peak in stream flow occurs after a much shorter time than the time that it would take for the rainwater to get all the way to the stream. Because we only have to wait for the pressure wave to reach the stream. And that's a diffusion type problem, uh, a pressure diffusion type problem. Now we have the same, we have an analogous issue when we're talking about a landslide that is in particular a very steep slope that is already wet um, and it starts raining really hard on it. Um, that very quickly the pore pressure, in this case, we saw the water dripping out the bottom, but imagine that water dripping out the bottom is now contributing to the height of the water table in that soil, right? So instead of water dripping out, we'd have a water table rising. And so that water table, even a perched water table, say above the bedrock soil interface, is going to rise much more quickly or rise much sooner than it would even take the rainwater to get from the surface down to that soil bedrock interface. And certainly faster than it would take these, the surrounding, uh, say, a hectare size watershed, uh, a hectare is, is 10,000 square meters uh, or a hundredth of a square kilometer. Um, certainly faster, sooner than it would take the water that's raining on that surrounding area to reach that point. Then we've got a case where we tend to get the landslides in these places that topographically focus flow. Um, but one way to think of that is that, okay, the, that topographic focusing of flow gets us sort of a background wetness or soil moisture that's higher than the surrounding areas that don't have such a large area contributing flow to them. We get that hydrologic response in the, in the form of pore pressure. A pore, and, and in the case of, the, of what we're looking at, pore pressure sufficiently large to trigger a landslide given uh, given the cohesion of the soil and so on, and the, and the slope of the topography, the thickness of the soil and so on. Now, given the force balance, uh, that rise in pore pressure that occurs very quickly after it starts raining hard is enough to tip that force balance towards 
land flooding. And we can look at it in a number of ways. We can think about how high a water table do we need in order to trigger a landslide or given a certain amount of rainfall, is it gonna fail or not? And we can even ask, um, you know, is, is, this a, is this a situation where we would ever get uh, saturation over land flow? That is if I'm spraying on my paper towel there, um, can I ever, <laughs> is it possible for me to spray hard enough and fast enough on that for the water table to rise all the way to the surface of the towel and start dripping out the top? Um, and uh, boy, I said like that, it's like, well, duh, no. Um, well, it turns out in the in the Oregon Coast Range and a lot of places in Western Oregon, it does never rain hard enough except, um, well, at least let's say, okay, in forested areas, it never rains hard enough for us to get saturation overland flow. And if it did, the, the slopes would be denuded of soil via landsliding long before we got saturation overland flow. Now at Chip Ross Park, you know, yeah, there we can get saturation over land flow. We can get um, rainfall sufficient to uh, flow over the flow over the grass and um, and lay it down and move gopher mound tailings down slope. 